Good morning, Chapel family. It is a delight to see each of you here worshiping in this uh, historic Belvoir Chapel, and then also for those who happen to be joining us uh, live uh, or perhaps even later. Uh, we continue to social distance, wear masks, except for the moments when we're speaking into the mic. Uh, we're doing everything in the uh, back as you enter to keep uh, you safe and uh, our community safe. So please uh, prayerfully consider opportunities to come out and be here in person. Uh, we also offer a communion that first Sunday of the month if you'd like to be here to receive. Uh, we do have a limit uh, per our post commander, uh, which is 50. And we uh, simply have an RSV uh, process that you'll find on our Facebook page. Uh, if you'll simply look up uh, Belvoir Traditional Protestant Service, uh, like that page, uh, get connected, uh, then we'll begin to, you'll begin to see newsletters uh, coming into your email. And so we would, delight, uh, we would be delighted to have you uh, be a part of our service in person. This morning, we're also uh, grateful to have um, Chaplain Benjamin Jung. Uh, ben is a colleague of mine in the medical community, Army Medicine. Uh, he's an Army Medicine clinically trained chaplain and serves at Fort Belvoir Community Hospital. And so uh, if you happen to be over there, he may be walking around and uh, you'll see a familiar face here. But uh, I'm grateful uh, for Ben. Appreciate you being here, brother. And we look forward to hearing God's word from him uh, shortly. Knowing of no other announcements, uh, let us uh, come to the Lord in uh, recognition of his holiness and his goodness and his grace to us. Hear these words from the prophet Micah as our call to worship. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Friends, these good news these words are good news, even from old. For generation to generation, we have had that story of God's goodness and grace to us. And we know the rest of the story. It is in Christ Jesus. And friends, it is because of his life, his death, his resurrection, his glorification, that we are even here this day to freely worship him and to be exalted into the heavens with him as he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And so I invite you to stand with me as we worship the Lord, singing left high the cross of Christ, verses 1 and 5. Let us sing.
Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, our Savior, we glorify in your name, the sacred name that is above all names. You are majestic, and you are beyond our understanding. And yet you have reached down to us in Christ Jesus to be for us. As you have promised from old that you will be our people, that you will be our God and we will be your people. Oh God, we give you thanks for that covenant, that love that you have, that in your great holiness that you would come and touch us, to be with us. And, O oh Lord, as we recognize your goodness and your grace to us, we come with anticipation of hearing anew today your word that will embolden us, empower us, and strengthen us to sustain us for the days ahead, for all the challenges that we face. We are so grateful, O oh Lord, that we come into the presence of your holiness. O oh Lord, we bless your holy name. Amen. Please join me in singing that great hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us sing together. seated. At this time in our worship, we recognize our need for God's grace because our need is so evident in our daily life of struggle with sin, with the world, and with the enemy himself. I'm so grateful for a community of believers. One of the highlights before we pray this confession is to receive from one another 
uh, the goodness of community. And this week, as I was prepping in the newsletter for my message, I was reminded of someone that I knew from a while ago in seminary, a professor that I some, from time to time reference, uh, my worship professor, Scotty Smith. And I shared a prayer in that newsletter, and that triggered uh, someone in the uh, chapel to recognize uh, that prayer. And if you don't mind, Darnell, I'd like to, well, I've just, I've just recognized you. <laughs> but I so appreciate you thinking to share with me a prayer of confession, and that's what that prayer was that came to you in that moment of worship. And so we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, uh, many who have gone before us into the Lord's presence, and many that will come even after us. And so I want us to recognize from time to time that beauty of the continuation of the legacy of this Fort Belvoir Chapel and community at large, and particularly our service here. And so as we begin in these moments, as I lead us in confession privately, uh, at the end, I'll be reading a prayer that's, uh, uh, this prayer that, that Darnell Hendrickson shared with me this week, and I think it's very fitting in our preparation to come before the Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess our sins to you because you invite us to. You indeed command us to. Your word urges us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord. Oh, Father, we in our private individual moments now confess to you our sin silently. O oh Lord, I am unable to forget my sins and my failings. I remember them in the bitterness of my soul. I am anxious about them. I turn away and groan. I have indignation and revenge against myself. O oh Lord, why is my repentance not deeper and fuller? O oh Lord, help my unbelief. O oh Lord, forgive and pardon those things which bring anxiety down on me those things in me at which my own heart takes offense. Cleanse me from my secret faults, too, and keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Dear Christ, you know the affliction and agony of my temptations, for you can sympathize with my weakness. At times I know the sweet taste of victory over sin. The Spirit softens my heart and melts my selfishness into a grateful obedience. But, O oh Lord, I am still tempted, because so many things hold the promise of good, of security, of pleasure, of life. In the fierce moment when the lure would overpower me, open my eyes to see that whatever is against your commands will only suffocate me and snuff out my life. In the lonely wilderness, O oh Lord, you fought the enemy and withstood him. But I, though not in the wilderness, often do not withstand, and even sometimes am unwilling to fight. O oh Lord, hear me and forgive me for your own name's sake, so that what you have begun in me might be finished. Amen. For while we were still weak, the book of Romans reminds us, and at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thanks be to God for the mercy that he promises and the forgiveness that he gives to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us continue in prayer as we think of others in need. Our gracious God, again, our loving Father, we come to you in recognition that you are worthy to be worshipped. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the freedom that we have to be amongst you in this country and to worship you openly. O oh Father, we thank you for the warmth of your embrace in this moment of worship, that your spirit is present with us as we lift high the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we recognize that our world is 
filled with uncertainties and that we are often faced with even our own individual challenges and uncertainties. But we are so great and grateful that your promises are certain and unchangeable. Even those that may seem to be in leadership in our nation from time to time fail us, both in character and in words and in deed. Forgive us, O oh Lord, forever focusing our hopes and our dreams on one individual, especially a human. May we always recognize your goodness and your grace, and may we come before you with that sense of humility and understanding that you sustain us and that you watch over us. You are immovable and eternal. Oh, Lord, thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and all the fears that trouble us and leave them there at the foot of your cross, knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we require. Thank you, O oh Lord, as we draw near in worship, as we are transported from a world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence and find healing and wholeness and refreshment. O oh Lord, as we have continued in this worship to think of those that have been with us, that have been in ill health over the past several Sundays, we've mentioned their names, and I add to that list this one name, Mary Macadori. Well, Father, we pray that you would be with her in her recent fall that she sustained, that you would be with her uh, physicians and all who attend to her. We thank you for the gifts and talents of her musical abilities that sustained our choir for several decades here in this worship service. We thank you for her family that continues to care for her there in Richmond. We pray for Mary McAdory. We pray for all those who don't come to us here in this service, but come to our mind from time to time, even as we walk around our community and we see those who are in need with sulken faces and, and, and eyes on the ground, we know that there are hurts, and a simple hello, a simple greeting may be just the thing that you are calling us to do, O oh Lord, to welcome others into your kingdom by being a servant that loves others selflessly. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this opportunity that we have to be revived in worship and in devotion as we continue, O oh Lord, to seek to be faithful disciples as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join me in standing as we sing our hymn number 347, And Can It Be? Let us sing together.
It's good to be in the house of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, choir and organist, for leading us in worship today as we worship the Lord on this Sunday. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And thank you, uh, Chaplain Almond, for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, God's Word. In today's reading, I will go into Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. And I think a lot of us know uh, this chapter very well, especially if you're a minister of the Lord, because this is sometimes uh, used in our ordination service or our credentialing service or our call to ministry. And certainly this is an important um, word in Scripture, as the book of Isaiah is. So I'm going to go into the Word of God, but before I do, I'm going to pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I come before your throne, Lord, as your humble servant. Father, as the Word says, and I say, and I confess, that I am ruined, I am a man of unclean lips. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable to you. Because you know, I know, I know, And I see dimly, but I know you know and see in full. And I ask that you allow us to see in full, Father, as you see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The theme of this message is justice and righteousness. Now, we may not necessarily see that straight off, but it is the running theme throughout the entire book of Isaiah. Justice and righteousness talks about God's judgment as well as his salvation. It is that root under the soil. It is that that stream of water running beneath this entire chapter. And I want us to keep keep this in mind. Justice and righteousness is very important in our relationship with God. And Isaiah sees it in chapter 6. He understands that these two words 
have a profound meaning of God's judgment and hope for him as well as Israel. I'd like to read Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. And I'm going to expound upon the verses as I go along. So if you open up your Bibles to chapter 6 and follow along with me, I encourage you to do so. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, when we read this verse, we see that there is a, a, an appearing of God before Isaiah in the temple of Jerusalem. You see, Isaiah is in the temple and is ministering on behalf of his people who are living in sin, living in disobedience, and God appears before him, just as he appeared before John on the island of Patmos, and he shows himself to be God. Now, this is, when, when we read this passage, we just see a revelation of God, a revealing of God. But when you look intently into the Word of God, you see more than just God, you see the bridegroom. You see here, we see that the train of his robe filled the temple. God is making himself known to be the bridegroom of his people, the bride. And above him, above God, were seraphs, and they were flying. They were covering their faces, and when they were singing to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There was angelic praise. It was like a wedding. It was a celebration of the bridegroom and his holiness and his brilliance and his purity and his majesty. God was showing him to be a God of love that continues to pour out his love and his mercy upon his people. Although he is a God of judgment, a God of just, uh, justice. He loves his people, and he continues to be robed as the bridegroom, although Israel is living in sin, although his bride is committing adultery. God's brilliance and God's glory is so exploding, so, so thunderous, so heavy. You know, the word for God's glory means kabod, means heaviness. Have you ever experienced God's heaviness to the point where you experience God's love where your heart is pounding and it's overflowing and all you can do is just stand in awe of him. And that is what Isaiah was experiencing at this time. The sound of the the seraphs, the sound of their voices was so strong and powerful that the doorpost and the thresholds were shaking. It was like you take this chapel and if you shook it, if there was an earthquake going on, I think a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, we got the earthquake alert on our, on our phones. But God's shaking and his movement in his church and his temple is much stronger than that. It is a powerful force of his love. And what's interesting here is that it says the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. This describes God's heavenly throne room, his home. This describes the bridegroom's home. In Deuteronomy, it talks about that Israel is to have the word of God on the door frames and on the gates. Why? To show 
that they belong to God, that they are God's bride. Well, it, sh it shows here that God is the bridegroom and on his doorposts and on his thresholds is his name. And that is our home. That is our place. Verse 5 says, Woe to me. Woe to me. I think the Hebrew word or, the, or the, what they say in Yiddish today is oy vey. You know, oy vey. It means like, oh my God, what's going on? You know, the, the oy vey is conveys kind of like uh, as if your son went to school and he came back and he, on his report card and it was all F's. <laughs> you know, hopefully you haven't had that experience. <laughs> Oy vey! Woe is me, Isaiah cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah is having a wonderful experience of God's glory, of his brilliance. And he says, and he makes this confession, I am a man of unclean lips. I, and Isaiah is a priest of God, he says, I am a people of unclean lips. When you come before the Lord God Almighty, you are all struck by his purity by his majesty, and all you can do is look at yourself and say, I cannot, I do not compare. I am just a worm in his presence. In the presence of the King of glory, the Lord God Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And this is interesting because one of the seraphs took one of the coals from the altar and touched him. What does that mean? It means that there is a greater, a greater offering. That Isaiah being unpure needs to be purified. He needs to be made holy by God. And the offerings that the Israelites present before God is not enough. Verse 7, with it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. God provides salvation to his people. We cannot provide salvation for ourselves through works or our abilities, but God provides salvation from his hand alone. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears, excuse me, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. When I first read this, I was like, what? I, I don't understand. Is, is God hardening his people's heart? Is that what's happening? Is that is what's happening? No, not at all. This God is talking about the condition of his people who are living in sin. And he's hitting on these finer points of the body, soul, and spirit, which is essential components in our relationship with God and Israel's relationship with God. God 
The people of Israel forgot their commandment to love the Lord with all of their hearts and all of their souls and all of their minds. They forgot the Shema. They forgot the holy word of God. They forgot their relationship with God and they have turned away by looking at other foreign gods, by worshiping them and by doing so. Their minds have become dull to the word of God. Their ears have become dull to the voice and the understanding of the word of God. And what they see, they cannot see God. They cannot see God working in their lives. They have walked away from God so much that they have become desensitized to God's spirit, to God's love. And they have become a people to themselves. Isaiah talks about that good has become you know, evil has become good. You know, the, that the bitterness has become sweet. They have traded these things where, where truth of God is no longer the truth of God. They have accepted the lie of the world instead of God's truth. This talks about Israel's situation, their condition of sin, their condition of disobedience. You know, sometimes we think that it's difficult for us to obey God, when in fact it's, it's probably the easiest path to go on in this life. You know, but... Unfortunately, we choose and we make mistakes. And even though that God has created a plan for us, God has already provided us this way, we sometimes make that mistakes. Israel made that mistake. Israel made that mistake. God laid it out before them that there are two pathways you can go in life. There are two pathways you can go in life. There is a pathway of obedience or there is a pathway of disobedience. The obedient life is the blessed life and the misfortunate life is the disobedient life. This is a current that, that is, goes throughout the Bible. I mean, if we, if we look at the Torah, if we look at the book of the prophets, and if you look at the book of the writings that begins with Psalms 1, we can see that the, either you choose the life of obedience or you choose the life of disobedience. God laid it out be, to Israel at the very beginning prior to them embarking on their journey into the promised land. And he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep this commandment of love with you. He will love you and bless you and increase your, num your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, olive oil, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, and the land he swore to your ancestors. The Lord will keep you free from disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. Now, who would not want that? Who would not want to live the obedient life, the blessed life with God? To live in comfort, to live in peace, not to live in want, but live in the assurance that tomorrow God will be with us no matter what the situation. 
that we may be criticized, we may fall into a crisis, but God will continue to bless us, that he will continue to give us a prosperous life because of our faithfulness and our obedient life to him. But unfortunately, Israel continued to choose the disobedient life. God warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Very succinct. God expounds on the life of obedience and he tells them, it will be a life of prosperity. It, was a, it will be a life of glory. It will be a life of comfort. It will be a life of security, a life of salvation. But on the other hand, if you disobey God, if you disobey me, you will be destroyed. And we see Israel living such a life in Isaiah's day. They were living a life to themselves. They were living a life to their own pleasures. Now, when you do a little historical study and you, come, and you, and you see that during this period, they were not living in economic doom. They were not living in a political crisis. They were not living in a health crisis. But they were a nation that was affluent. They were a nation that was wealthy. They were a nation that had secure borders and living in peace with, the, with their neighboring allies. Their king, Uzziah, was a righteous man by far, and so was his father. He only made one mistake, and that was walking into the temple of God. But by far, he was a good man. He worshiped God. He exalted God in his life. Although he did accept other foreign gods and he did not rid, get rid of them, the nation was doing well. And so was Uzziah's son, Jotham. So when we see this verse, we see that Isaiah is living in a quandary. He sees that Outside, there are people that are sinning, but yet God is going to pour judgment upon them because of their disobedience, because of their waywardness from God. Verse 11, Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he answered me, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone away and the land is utterly forsaken. There is going to be doom and God's judgment is going to be upon this people because they have forsaken him. They have broke relationship with the bridegroom. They have walked away from God. God, the people of Israel, has caused an injustice to God by living in a life of disobedience. God said to Israel at the very beginning of Isaiah, chapter 16 and 20, Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do good. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. Seek justice. Seek justice. God is telling Isaiah and the people of Israel to seek justice. What is justice? What is justice? What is the justice that God is seeking? What is the justice that God is calling his people to be?
justice in the Hebrew word is mesfa, and it means to bring, to right the wrong. To right the wrong. And throughout the book of Israel, uh, Isaiah, the first five chapters, you see justice and righteousness together, combined together. So what is righteousness? It means to restore your relationship. It means to be in that right relationship with God. So when you see these words together, which are very similar, it's like the two sides of the same coin. When you put them together, God is calling his people to a restorative justice, to re have a relationship with him, to be reconciled with him. That is the restorative justice that God is seeing. We hear a lot about social justice. We hear a lot about the justice in our society and people seeking justice. God's justice is above and beyond that because we know that human justice and the justice that, human, uh, that humanity or, or man can articulate is broken, falls short. But God's justice is true and complete. It is the justice of God that we are called to seek. Isaiah 6.13 says this, and I want to wrap it up. It says this. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid to waste. But as a tabernacle and oak leave stumps, leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seal seed will be the stump in the land. What is this seed? This seed is the virgin birth that Isaiah speaks about in chapter 7. Let me read to you quickly that verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. My friends, the seed is the son of God who died on the cross for our sins. He is the servant of, just, of justice that is spoken about in Isaiah chapter 42. He is the servant of justice that is spoken about in Isaiah 53. On the cross, when Christ called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out as an innocent man on the cross for our behalf. This was an anguish, anguish of, the soul, of the Holy Son of God who cried, who carried the sins of the world. He was tormented by the curse of sin. That is justice, my friends. Justice is for God. God has restored us to himself and brought us into a relationship of reconciliation. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting men's sin against them. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne. And we acknowledge, O oh God, Father, Lord, that we have broke relationship with you, that we have lived in sin, that we have lived the wayward life and not the obedient life. But we know, O oh God, that you have, by your grace and by your love, Father, have paved the way for us so that we may live in hope and in salvation, being united once again with you, who is the bridegroom, Father, we humble ourselves to you and we ask you, O oh God, Father, to seek in us, to see in us your love and your grace, 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For that grace and that goodness that we know is the offspring that is recognized even from time of old. Uh, we stand now uh, to sing, to receive that goodness and that grace uh, in Jesus Christ as we uh, sing this great hymn, He Touched Me, a recognition of our personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let us stand and sing. One brief announcement uh, before we receive the blessing of the benediction. Uh, next Sunday, uh, the 25th, as uh, in many circles referred to as Reformation Sunday, and so we invite you to uh, be here present uh, for that, or at least to uh, make time to wor uh, worship there uh, at home. And uh, we have the honor of uh, our endorser uh, for the Presbyterian Reform uh, Church, uh, the P uh, Presbyterian Church in America, Dr. Reverend uh, Reverend Doctor, however you say that, <laughs> I should know, uh, uh, Jim Carter. He's a retired chaplain, army chaplain, and he will be with us next Sunday bringing the word. Uh, and so we uh, invite you to come enjoy that. And now let us receive this benediction. By grace of the Holy One who has touched your lips and atoned for your sins, may you run and not be weary. May you rise up on the wings of eagles. May you know without any doubt that the everlasting God goes with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord to serve.